Good evening. My name is Ruth Campagna and I am with Faye Hollow Homestead and today I'm doing part two of my four-part medicinal herb garden tour. Now this tour is a full tour and I'm giving you all the herbs and then I'm also giving you some of the uses that I have for those herbs too and why I planted them specifically. There will be a couple of herbs in here that are a little bit more notoriously difficult to grow uh, that I might go into how I grew them uh, but I think mostly I'm going to keep that video to a separate video uh, and then answer any questions that you guys have like that in the comments. Okay so let's get started. Last time that we were in the garden I did this top area which has a lot of herbs in it because that is a very sandy well draining soiled area um, but those are not necessarily the ones that I was super excited about growing necessarily. Now some of them, it took a while for me to be able to get those herbs in order to grow them. And so I am very excited about them like, uh, like the Rhodiola rosea. That's a big deal. The Agastache, not the Agastache, I'm going to talk about Agastache in a second. Uh, the Astragalus, that one was a big deal. Uh, things like Valerian and Bone Set, that's a big deal. Okay, well, I just, <laughs> I'm just going to start doing a list of all the ones that I like soon. Uh, but here I am. I'm in my main garden area. Those two center beds, those are my vegetable beds. And I do like to put herbs in there as well. But the bed that goes all the way around my two vegetable beds, those are all herbs um, with maybe a vegetable or two thrown in there between the herbs. So... I'm very excited to do this tour. Let's get started. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about my Agastache, uh, and then we'll go on to Hishuu, which is a really good one. Now, most of these I grew from seed. This is Agastache, and I'm very excited to have it start flowering. Uh, this year, last year, it flowered for the first time, and it was beautiful, and it is bushier this year, so that's good. So Agastache is, is a good sedative herb. Uh, it's good for anxiety. Um, so, like valerian over here, valerian is more uh, a sedative as far as uh, muscle sedative and will make you go to sleep that way. Agastache is more of a sedative for your emotions. So there's a difference right there. That would work really well together if you wanted to do a sleep, te a sleep tea blend or something like that. Uh, Hishiwu, also known as faux tea. Now, I did not intend for this to grow again la this year. I ordered a new plant because I was going to harvest all the roots, and I've just gotten so busy that I didn't get to harvest the roots. And I fully expected this to die back because it's not supposed to be hardy in my zone. And it's in a bucket, so it's not even in the ground. But it's, it's doing its thing, and I'm very excited about that. So uh, I will harvest the roots of this this fall instead now. So Hishuwu is a, um, so a lot of my plants that I have in my garden are for cancer. Uh, I really like to have uh, adaptogenic herbs um, and then just for, you know, vitality and aging. And I don't know if you guys can tell, but I'm sure you can. I've got quite a lot of gray hair going on and that's just what comes with, you know, having twins <laughs> and then another baby the next year. Um, as well as just getting old, which I am. I'm definitely getting old. Uh, my husband, don't tell him I told you, but my husband turned 40 today. Hishuwu helps with healthy aging. It helps with diabetes. Um, it helps with cancer. It helps with, um, um, it helps with heart disease. Uh, those are good things with Hishuwu. Uh, the legend of, um, of the man who found Hishuwu and started using it as a herb was that he was a elderly gentleman in China and he was completely gray and he had no kids and um, he started taking Hishuwu as a tea and his hair turned black again and he ended up having a whole bunch of kids. Take that as you will. Okay, so here is something also that I'm very excited about. This is my calamus, or my sweet flag. And if you see, it's in a container here. It also has watercress in here. But uh, calamus, here's some of the 
heads coming up. Calamus root is a really interesting looking root. Um, and I use this container. It's actually the bottom of a karate kickboxing bag um, that my father-in-law cut in half for me. So it, it holds water because that's what those bags are designed to do. And so this turns into like a pond water feature kind of thing, which is what Calamus really likes. Calamus likes to grow in ponds. And so I get to have this. Um, Calamus, as far as herbal remedies, uh, it's a very detoxifying herb. Uh, it's very good for toothaches, headaches. Uh, if you have a skin disease, you can use this. Uh, and then also cancer because, well, that's really important to me. Okay, moving on down and kind of taking over my cucumbers. I did put cucumbers in this spot because I thought that the evening primrose was going to kind of keep to itself a little bit, but apparently it's liking leaning over. You can see my cucumbers right here. Um, but the evening primrose is beautiful. I'm really excited about this. It, you can see some of the flowers down there, those yellow flowers. Uh, uh, evening primrose has also self-seeded all throughout the garden, um, and I love it. So uh, evening primrose helps with uh, asthma. This is a very, um, a very good herb for women. So uh, it helps with like menopause, PMS symptoms, uh, bones, keeping your, your bones in good health, uh, which a lot of women struggle with later on in life. Uh, this can be used to help with liver cancer, uh, asthma, ADHD. Uh, this is a really, really great herb to have and it's beautiful and the pollinators absolutely love it. And you use the roots for this mostly. And then you can also use the flowers as well. So next to my evening primrose, I have motherwort and I was so excited somebody was talking about how uh, the motherwort leaves look a lot like the mugwort leaves that I have over here and they're absolutely right absolutely right um, this is covered with pollinators normally can you see that bee right there uh, it is later in the evening but there's still I see three already bumblebees or bees of some sort on here uh, but motherwort is also good for women right uh, it helps with anxiety during childbirth uh, it helps with any kind of female reproductive disorders um, oh and evening primrose I also want to put this out there that also helps tonify uh, the the female reproductive area uh, and if you take enough tincture of this, it'll permanently tone it, which is really cool. Uh, sorry, so back to motherwort. Uh, this helps with female reproductive disorders, also helps with like the mammary, mammary glands. So this is a good thing to have um, on hand if you are pregnant or having a baby, nursing, stuff like that. I don't remember if I necessarily talked about Jagalon in my last video, but this is Jagalon right here. There it is. There's my jaguar, and it's a vine, and it grows, and it spreads, and it's wonderful. But I use it all uh, every year. I'm anxious to see if it comes back because I use it all. Uh, jaguar is really big for bronchitis. It's like it's an adaptogenic, and it's almost as good as like having ginseng on hand, uh, and it's very easy to grow. So that's a really good thing. It also helps with cholesterol. Uh, blood pressure, heart function, stuff like that. So Jagalon is really good and it's also very mild. So when you put that in teas, it's not very uh, uh, intense when you when you have it, which is nice. Okay, so we're moving down past the motherwort, which is a little bit prickly. You can kind of see the spines around the flowers and so you don't really want to brush up against the motherwort. And all this green coming up besides my dandelion right here, this is all hops that are coming up. And then here are my hops that I have encouraged to grow. And so you can kind of see, here are the buds coming out. Hops are really, really great to have. Hops are a really good sleep aid. They grow really, really well. This is a good screen or cover as well. 
Uh, they're good for sleep aids. Uh, so they're also very calming. They're good for anxiety or restlessness. Uh, they do have a lot of estrogen in them though, so don't don't take it too much if you're a male and you don't want the estrogen. I mean, if you want the estrogen, go for it, right? But anyway, so normally I have St. John's wort right here, uh, but I'm actually going to have to get a new plant of that because the hops kind of engulfed this before I was able to get a hold of it. Um, St. John's wort, this empty spot that should have it, St. John's wort, uh, which will have St. John's wort very soon, actually, uh, is really good for depression, anxiety, if you're tired a lot, um, if you have heart, heart palpitations, um, OCD, ADHD, if you're super moody. Um, so that's really good. And then this, oh, oh my goodness. So this is my silver wormwood, and you can see why it's called silver worm, wormwood, uh, also known as Artemisia absinthium absethium how oh, i can't pronounce it never mind we're gonna just go with silver wormwood okay so uh this is a bitter and we talked about bitters before helping really with like the digestive system with the liver cleansing stuff like that um it's a it's a tonic for the liver gallbladder digestive system and then it's also a vermicide so that's good to have on hand and moving on from here, and it's so soft and so pretty. I might just plant this around just to have like decorative. Um, and here is my Ella Campaign. And you can tell right next door is the catnip because that's where the cats always hang out. But the Ella Campaign has these beautiful stalks that come up and they look like sunflowers almost with like real thin petals. It's really, really gorgeous. Um, I'm going to have to harvest all of these this year because we're getting to the point, if you have them for longer than two years, it's not good. Um, the, the roots become too tough and woody. And so this is on its second year. I'm going to have to harvest this and see if I can get a couple of root cuttings and kind of um, propagate some new ones that way. But um, elecampane is a uh, another really big anti Herb. So it's antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, um, antimicrobial. Uh, it's good for asthma, bronchitis, uh, and then again, intestinal worms, just like the Artemisia over there. And then catnip. Now, this used to be a ginormous, huge bed of catnip. And... I let my cats come in here a little bit too much this spring, I think. But I've got a nice catnip right here, there, and then over there. And it will very rapidly and gladly spread for me later on. So I'm, I'm really not too worried about the catnip. Um, but the catnip is uh, a very good herb to have if you have children. Uh, it's it's, a, it's a, a light herb, right? So it's not going to be too powerful or too intense. Here comes, here comes Sawyer, hanging out with Edward. They are now best buds, which is really nice. Are you gonna eat some of that? Okay, so catnip is uh, soothing. It's a sedative. Uh, it's good for cramps. Like, this is really good for cramps. Um, indigestion, it helps induce menstruation, which is good because, I mean, sometimes, sometimes it just needs to happen. Uh, it's a good, uh, anesthetic, if you're chewing the leaves, it will numb your mouth, which is something that I've had to do several times this year because of toothaches um, with getting my getting my wisdom teeth taken out. So I really appreciate having this herb. Um, and I've noticed something about that is that it is so nice to have the herb when you need it rather than need the herb and so then order it and plant it then. Okay, so... This is my, um, my catnip, and here is my ashitaba. I'm gonna come back to the spider wart in just a second. But my ashitaba, uh, this is a, a really, really good ashitaba too. There's a, there's a few different varieties. I forget exactly the type of this one, but I know that I had to be on a waiting list for this one. Um, it is a powerful antioxidant. Uh, it also helps with heartburn, uh, stomach ulcers, 
cancer, again, right? Uh, fever, arthritis, obesity, uh, stuff like that. So this is this is really good. And then Dongling Cow is behind it. That's what this this herb back here is. This is all Dongling Cow, uh, and that will turn into a a shrub, bushy kind of thing. Uh, I'm really excited that it kind of spread out. It did go to seed last year, and I wanted more. So this is great. Um, so the Dongling Cow is very good for breast cancer and that's something that has been in my family quite a lot so uh, that was a priority for me to have this um, it's good for sore throats arthritis and then it's also good for other cancers as well but uh, i specifically wanted it because it is specific for breast cancer now the spiderwort i just planted these as um, bare root plants and you can kind of see the stuff coming up from the roots, which is really good. There's a little bit coming up from the stem of this back one over here, which is good too. Um, I'm really excited to have that kind of establish itself here. But so, spiderwort is a laxative. Uh, it's good for kidney and stomach ailments. Uh, you can mash the leaves up and use those for insect bites. Uh, also, cool thing, spiderwort, the flowers or the stamens of this flowers will turn pink if there is a, if there's nuclear fallout or there's any kind of radiation in the air, um, not that I'm gonna be checking my spider wart every day, but I just think that's cool. Anyway. Okay, so I'm gonna go from the Ashtaba. Here is my calendula. Now I'm pointing out this calendula uh, just because it's here, <laughs> but I've got calendula planted along all the beds all the way down like every two feet Everywhere. I mean, here's calendula. There's calendula like it's literally everywhere. So uh, calendula Is a very good skin herb. These leaves are so soft uh, It's a really good. Uh, what did I say? It's a skin herb. So um, Making salves out of calendula is a big deal uh, it's good for the digestive system, the immune system, and so then with the skin, like burns, cuts, hemorrhoids, acne, stuff like that. And then moving on from there. This is an herb that I planted and I totally forgot what it is. And that just happens to me sometimes, so I'm going to have to... I'm gonna have to watch it as it blooms. It looks like it's gonna bloom pretty soon and kind of just see what it does. If anybody knows what this is, let me know because I needed to write that one down for sure. Okay, so uh, let's see. This is another one. I don't necessarily know what this one is either. I got a order in that I don't have the, the order slip for um, from a herb company and I stuck a bunch of them right here. And so I don't know what this one is. I don't know what this one is. I gotta look it up. Um, but here we are. Let me back up a little bit. This is my self heal. Some people call it all heal, um, but I mean, just think about the name, self heal, right? I'm really excited to actually to harvest this very soon. It's it's about ready. Um, uh, self heal helps with skin wounds. It draws out infections from like abscesses and boils. Uh, you can use this for internal ulcer ulcers as well. And this is something that grows wild in a lot of places. And so if I ever see it growing in the lawn or something like that, I won't cut it back because I know we don't use pesticides. And so I wanna use the seed heads or the flower heads from the things out in the yard more than I wanna use the ones here because I know I have a stash here and I don't necessarily know if there's always gonna be a stash out there. So I'll save this one and I'll use the ones out there. Okay, so after my self heal, is one that I always have a little bit of anxiety about 
every year on whether or not it's gonna come back. And so far it really has, because this is, I also have self heal back here. I mean, it's, this is kind of like a wild area of my herb garden. Um, and here's some more self heal. Okay, so anyway, back to this. This is my African dream root. And this is really, I mean, it's from Africa, right? So the zone is, I think seven, 7b and I am a zone 6 and so I cover this up with a lot of leaf mold every year and then I pull that leaf mold back in the spring uh, because one it self sows and then two I don't want to have to push through too much in order to come up because you harvest the roots and I did harvest the roots from a couple of plants last year so I was a little bit nervous is it gonna come back again this year but they have like it has the most beautiful flowers that you can't see yet but it will be out soon and I'm just hoping that it spreads really well. I'm hoping. But as you can kind of tell from the uh, the name of this, uh, but African dream root is really good for uh, dream inducing. And so a lot of shamans uh, in Africa use this, and this was like their main herb to create a, a, a dream that is potent, prophetic, and then you can also kind of control uh, what they call lucid dreaming. Um, and so this is a really big, really, really interesting herb to have. I don't know a lot of people who have this growing. I'm very excited to have it. Um, it took a while to be able to get this one. Uh, it's also really good for fevers. And then also going along with that, that dream thing and the lucid dreaming, it's really good for delirium. Anyway, I think that's super cool. Okay, so um, the African dream root, and then you can see through here I have rue, and I have rue planted along this outer bed, all along the outside. I like to plant herbs on the outside of the beds too, or outside of the garden as well. Just a chance to draw in more pollinators and more space to, to grow stuff. But uh, rue is really good for menstrual cramps, um, eye problems headache, um, if you have certain types of cancers, rue will help, but it's also just like a really beautiful plant. Um, if you kind of see, like it's got those bulbous looking leaves and the flowers are really pretty. I just, I really like rue a lot. Rue and then my plantain. And I encourage plantain to grow throughout my garden because I had a bed of plantain for a while um, and it didn't come back and it scared me that I won't have it anymore in my garden because I specifically planted the narrow leaf in here. Um, and there's a lot of plantain growing out in the yard, but that's more like broadleaf plantain and this is more medicinal. So I let this go to seed and if it pops up, it pops up. Um, plantain. I used this in a video making uh, my chicken coop or the, the chicken run and I got hit by stinging nettles because I had to transplant my stinging nettle bed and I chewed up the leaves and I immediately rubbed it on where the stinging nettle hit me and I kid you not I was cured immediately. I mean it was it was a really big deal. I had never been hit by stinging nettles before and it hurt it hurt a lot, a lot, a lot. And um, as soon as I chewed it up and I rubbed it on there, uh, the sting went away. And then I talked about that on my video and my uh, one, of, one of my viewers on that video talked about how uh, they had a very infected foot from stepping on a nail and their father put a plantain leaf in a sock on their foot and they went to bed and the next morning the, the infection was gone. So, uh, big, awesome herbal plant that you want to have in your garden for sure, for sure. And apparently it just always rains on me when I'm out here in the garden. So here's Feverfew, and we were talking about in the last video about how flowers like this usually have a really good uh, medicinal quality to them. So uh, Feverfew is good for fevers, but you kind of have to have been taking the tea for a while before you get the fever. So this is more of like a preventative rather than a cure, right? Uh, it's also good for migraines, arthritis, toothaches, infertility, uh, anything dealing with menstruation, 
Uh, and then also it helps with labor. And it's beautiful. <laughs> and it's a really good pollinator. Okay, so uh, this is my Dan Shen. And this is also known as red sage. And you can tell that it's a sage because you, know, you look at those flowers, right? So Dan Shen uh, has a red root and it's, it's like very intense red. It's really cool. Um, the Dan Shen is good for circulation. It's good for strokes, chest pain, heart disease, liver disease, stuff like that. Um, Dan Shen's a good one to have. I had my red stem wormwood right here and it moved, it self-seeded somewhere else. And so I've got to transplant it back over here, but this is where my red stem wormwood's going to be. Uh, and the red stem wormwood is really good for staph infections, jaundice, hepatitis, stuff like that. And then it's, as well, it's an artemisia, so it's that bitter. Uh, and then this is my blue vervain. Oh, look how pretty that is. So blue vervain is really good for a few things. Uh, I'm going to go stand underneath this tree because I'm getting rained on. Uh, so blue vervain is a anti-tumor herb, which is, I mean, obviously very good to have. have. Uh, it protects nerve cells really well. Um, it helps with anxiety. It's an antimicrobial. And then next to it is my pleurisy root. I'm going to go get an umbrella. <laughs> so of course, as soon as I get back to the house, the, uh, the rain stops. So anyway, I still got an umbrella just in case because I really want to finish this up. This is some good stuff going on, but I've got to show you this uh, butterfly weed or as they call it, pleurisy root. Oh my goodness, it's just so this is a native wildflower, and it is a host plant for the monarch butterfly. And you can see I have bunches of them coming up, which delights me. I take the, the flower or the seed heads from this in the fall, and I spread them all throughout the field out there. One day they'll, they'll catch hold. They'll be really good. But these have been getting hit really hard with uh, aphids the last few years. Oh, look at, you can see there's a bumblebee sleeping under the leaves right there. or trying to get out of the rain. And, um, and I believe it's because of these flowers that I have so many ladybugs now. Also, it is so much fun to come out here in the fall or in the summer and find like, we'll get handfuls of monarch butterfly caterpillars uh, and we'll bring them inside with some milkweed and we'll raise them uh, anyway, it's good stuff, but it's also a medicinal. Now it is definitely a low dose medicinal just to be aware. Uh, but it is, uh, good for coughs. Uh, it's really good for swelling and anything in the respiratory system. So like if you're, the lining of your lungs is swelling or the air sacs of your lungs or your airways, um, pleurisy root will really help with that. And then it also helps with the flu as well. <coughs> I should take one of my herbs for cough, apparently. Okay, so here is my marshmallow patch. And marshmallow spreads slowly, uh, but it does spread gradually. And uh, that makes me very happy because I love it. But I mean, look at these flowers. Isn't that just gorgeous? There's just like the lightest faint tinge of pink or purple, depending on the flower that you're looking at. But marshmallow uh, is really good for pain uh, or swelling of mucous membranes in the respiratory system. Uh, it helps with uh, stomach ulcers. If you have a UTI or if you have a uh, urinary uh, stones in your urinary tract. Uh, this will help with it. So I harvested a uh, a few plants last year and I used the roots and I used the leaves uh, but the roots were so oh, there's a word for this like very mucusy like like 
oh, what is that word? I'll think about it. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it right here. I'll figure out what that word is. It does better if you make a, a tincture of this with glycerate, which in and of itself is a very mucousy type of uh, textured uh, base for an herbal tonic, I guess. Um, but I wanted to do that one because it, it does better in that type of environment, but also uh, this is a really good children's herb and I don't want to be giving my kids, you know, vodka. <laughs> so <laughs> there is that. Uh, but I was washing the roots off and <laughs> as I was washing the roots off, it was, it was just oozing this, this mucus slime. And I, I had my husband uh, closed his eyes and I brought it over to him and he touched it and he t it totally freaked about it. He was like, what is that? But, um, I mean, like I held the roots up and it was literally just dripping with this mucus stuff. And so you can imagine that when you have like a very sore throat or uh, irritated throat or a cough or something like that, having this to take that is just going to really soothe and coat the lining of your airways uh, so that you don't have that pain or itching or anything like that anymore. Um, and it is really good for that. It is really good for that. <sighs> I think I sent marshmallow seeds in my last seed swap too, actually. Okay, so next to my marshmallow, I have echinacea. I have two types of echinacea. I have the regular purple cone flower, and then I have the narrow leaf um, echinacea as well. So, um, let me show you this. Now, a lot of these don't flower the first year. So like this did not flower the first year. This did not flower the first year. Uh, the elecampane did not flower the first year. Mullion doesn't flower the first year. Motherwort did not flower the first year. Uh, a lot of these don't flower the first year. The vervain did not. Um, and so getting to that second year of having this garden was a really big deal because now all of a sudden, not only do I have these herbs, but I have the flowers that go along with them too, which is really exciting. But now I'm in my third third year of flowering. So uh, this is my echinacea. Uh, echinacea is probably one of the most popular uh, herbs to take from home, even by people who are not fond of, of herbal remedies. Uh, but echinacea helps uh, shorten colds and flu. It reduces symptoms, helps boost the immune system. Uh, some herbalists have argued lately that it doesn't actually help uh, shorten colds or flus. It actually just boosts immunity. So if you take this before your colds and flus, you just like consistently take echinacea. That's a lot better than taking it just when you get sick. Oh, my pepper plants are doing some good stuff. Oh, I see. Sawyer's looking at the one. I hope to God he's hunting the vole right now. Wouldn't that be so good? You can see he's standing right next to some plantain that I did not pull up because I like to have bunches of plantain around. The onions are doing really well. I'm getting totally distracted. Look at those peppers. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So echinacea. We're going to get some flowers soon. And this is just humming with activity too when it starts to flower. Um, and the pollinators. So here's a variegated comfrey. This is a this is a white comfrey and you can see that it's kind of uh, past its prime. I need to cut this back and spread it out. Uh, and then here's some purple comfrey. I already talked about comfrey in my last one though. Oh look at my calendula. I think this might be my first one with a flower on it. No! Oh my goodness. Here's another calendula. Look at that. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, I'm so excited. I didn't cut calendula at all last year. The voles kept eating it. So this is kind of a big deal. Look at the comfrey is spreading. Well, that's burdock, not burdock. That's yellow dock right there. But uh, the comfrey is spreading. I'm so excited. I love that. And then in between, you can see the seed pods of poppy. Okay, poppy can be a medicinal herb as well, but I do not use poppy in the medicinal way. Um, they, uh, opium is made out of, <laughs> out of poppies. I grow poppies because poppies are my favorite flower, um, but I do not make opium. So I would not really recommend anybody else making opium. 
uh, especially on YouTube. <laughs> so uh, just know that, but poppies in general are just really beautiful. But if you do want to know, when you see the seed heads that look like that, that's what um, the opium is made from, is those, those seed heads with those seeds in there. Again, I've never done it, so I couldn't tell you the process, but that's what they use. So there's those. Here are my rows of Sharon trees. Got one here, one here, another one here. I didn't really mean to plant these. These I thought were uh, the, rode the, the roselle hibiscus, the red roselle. Uh, I had a, a bunch of seeds. Some of them were, and then a few of them were not, and they were this. And so I have these growing. I'm going to transplant them out beyond the garden gate here. But uh, Rose of Sharon is actually a really good medicinal as well. And what you use is the leaves. Um, the leaves help with, like, if you have itchy skin, uh, any kind of skin disease, it will help with that. Uh, and then people who are suffering from, like, dizziness, bloody stools that's accompanied with like a lot of gas uh, this would be a really good herb for them so uh, just know that you know who you are uh, got cucumbers uh, in this area gotta pull this out this is tree of heaven and it is not welcome in my garden and it grows way too fast. Uh, but I have uh, seeds spread here and I have full confidence that they're going to grow because <laughs> that's what they do. I mean, they're really, really good at growing. But this is my, well, I've got cucumber here, <laughs> some potatoes because I used to have a potato bed right here. The voles grabbed a bunch of pieces of it, pulled it through their tunnels, and now you can see where their tunnels are because there's potato sprouts coming out of them. Uh, and then here's some evening primrose that's self-seeded. Uh, but in this area, I have planted uh, seeds for holy basil. And that's never an issue for me uh, having that come up. Oh, there's a volunteer valerian. Uh, so the, the holy basil comes up. Holy basil is basically a, some people call it Tulsi. It's an adaptogenic uh, it's good for, you know, everything from uh, swine flu, diabetes, colds, headaches, fever, stress, earaches. Um, I mean, it's just really, it's good for everything. And I know that this is not necessarily a medicinal herb, but I do want to point out my glorious black hollyhocks. Aren't they gorgeous? I've got a bunch of them down there, too. But I mean, they're just stunning. Oh, they're just saying, I'm going to get a little bit closer because you deserve a close up of these beauties. This is the black hollyhock. Mm. Okay, moving on. Not that I want to because I could just stare at those all day. But this is right here. Uh, this is some garden sage and it's flowering and I love sage flowers. Um, and then next to it, with some more potatoes, because of those darn voles, is my skull cap. And look at these flowers on the skull cap. It's almost like a snapdragon. So I have skull cap here. Skull cap is actually, it was very difficult to get this to grow. Um, I have, there's some more plants right there. There's some more. There's some more right here, and then there's some more back there. Skullcap is a very wild plant, and so uh, you have to get like exactly the right conditions for them to, to want to grow. And um, I meant for them to grow behind this more because I heard that they like shade, but they have just drifted over here, and this is where they've taken up residence. And so, I mean, hey, if they like it better there, that's great. Uh, but I grow the uh, skullcap by a Biological, bi biological, biological. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's with a B, B A I. And um, skullcap is really good for insomnia, anxiety. Uh, if you have a stroke, uh, if you have paralysis from having a stroke, it's really good for everything. Like it's good for high cholesterol. I mean, you could use it for a rabies. 
um, if you have rabies, you could use it, um, diabetes, allergies, epilepsy. I mean, skullcap is a really big deal. I have not harvested the skullcap because what I wanted was to create as much seed as possible and get this to really like create a dense stand of, of plants in my garden where it wants to grow. And so this is my first year that I'm feeling confident enough to come out here and really start harvesting some to have for my apothecary. Okay, moving on down. See, there's some more skull cap right there. And my sunflowers. Here's my asparagus and some volunteer bachelor buttons. And I put a couple of melons in the asparagus bed because they can just kind of spread out. But, oh man, it's been dry the last few days. Do you see that that yellow with the red? Uh, it really, need, this stuff needs some water. Licorice, this is my licorice bed. And this is Galabra, Galabra. Um, this is the official version of licorice. This is not Russian licorice. It's not Chinese licorice. This is just straight up licorice. And um, I'm so proud because I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and then the, the voles hit them pretty hard the other day, the other year, and they pulled them through uh, their holes again, but it restarted from the roots. And so I've got some over here, I've got some over here, they spread, and I've got a couple in the pathway, and I'm just going to let them go because Licorice takes about five years to have the roots grow big enough for you to be able to harvest them. Also, licorice is a very difficult herb to grow. Uh, people spend years and years and years trying to create a, a stand of, of licorice plants that they can harvest from. And I am so thankful for the licorice that I have. I mean, it really... It really is doing good. You can't hardly see it though because of all this asparagus. Oh, the asparagus wasn't here. Maybe I can move this. It's a little bit better. And then there's some clover in there as well. But something that I found with licorice that's really important is you have to inoculate the soil with some mycorrhizals. Uh, and that's what really kind of gets them going and then you have to keep them very watered. For a while I thought that this was a nutrient deficiency and so I kept feeding it uh, duck food or duck water, green goodness, uh, and it didn't really, it didn't help because I was only watering it like once every week or two weeks because uh, I didn't want to give it too much fertilization. But what it really wanted was just water and so I've been really good about it this year. Obviously I've lacked, slacked off the last couple days but that's because I've been on a trip for a while. So um, I will get back into the swing of things and, and start watering these again but this licorice is a big deal that I have this. Uh, licorice could almost be considered an adaptogenic. It's so good for everything. Uh, it's good from everything from like heartburn, acid reflux, uh, hot flashes, coughs. Um, let me get you some close-up views. It's also a nitrogen fixer. So if you can get this stuff to grow, it's really good for a, a understory plant for your food forest. But I really want to get this started here and then move some of them to my food forest uh, because... I just, uh, it is difficult to get them to go. And so if I can get these going, then I'll feel better about moving them. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of these I planted from seed. I did order a couple of plants just because I was intent, I had to get them in the ground that year because if it takes five years uh, in order to be able to harvest this stuff, every year counts. And if I couldn't get them to start from seed, I wanted at least a couple in the ground that I could have you know, go in as soon as possible. Um, what else is this good for? Um, hot flashes, coughs. Um, this is good for like bacterial and viral infections. Isn't that just so pretty? Those leaves. 
you can tell it's a legume almost, right? Like, it looks legumey, doesn't it? Um, it's a really good tea for a sore throat. Licorice root is very sweet, like sugar almost. Like, this is an incredibly sweet root. And most things that you see that are like black licorice flavored are not actually flavored with real licorice roots because it is so difficult to grow them and it takes so long to be able to harvest them and um, and it's just and it kills the plant when you harvest them so anise actually tastes a lot like licorice and so most of the things that you eat that are licorice flavored are actually flavored with anise hyssop anise hyssop uh, rather than actual licorice uh, but licorice has a, a very intensely sweet um, root and so uh, that was one of the reasons why I had trouble with voles with it because I mean it's, it was like a candy shop for them um, let's see I do have a voodoo lily growing uh, but it has not popped up yet uh, the voodoo lily uh, I have that because it has uh, been tested for some anti-cancer uh, properties um, it's kind of gross. It's a really big flower that that ends up smelling like rotten meat once it flowers and it, it only blooms for a little while but and it's really really nasty uh, because flies are the thing that pollinate it and so it wants to draw in all the flies. Um, I only have it because it, it's supposedly good for cancer. Um, okay so next let me show you. So that's where my voodoo lily is going to pop up later. This is my uh, this is my le lemon bergamot, which is a type of monarda. Pounced. I hope he's getting it, whatever it is, and I hope he's not squashing any plants. If he's gonna eat that bowl, I'm happy. Here is my yellow dock. And I cut back all the stems on this because I did not want the yellow dock to go to seed. Um, but this fall, I'm going to harvest these uh, for the roots. So yellow dock is really good. I mean, <laughs> like, like really good. It's good for pain and swelling within the respiratory tract. And you can kind of see those leaves. I bet those look familiar to you. It is a very common weed. It's good for bacterial infection, infections. It good, it's good for STDs. And then here is yarrow. Look at how beautiful that is. Here's a really pretty one. But the most medicinal version of yarrow is this, is the regular white one that you'll find. I'm going to actually take this bed out because I have so much yarrow. If you look over here, let me zoom in a little bit. All that white over there, that's all yarrow. I have a bed of that in my food forest. So, oh, look at the mountains. I don't necessarily need to have this taking up space in my garden because at this point I have like two beds of yarrow and I don't need that. So I'm going to take this out, put something else here. I'm excited to figure out what I want to put in here. But yarrow is really good for bleeding. So you can take the flowers and you can crush them up and you can put them on a bleeding wound and it'll staunch the bleeding rapidly. I mean, it's worth having it just for that, right? Uh, it's also good for fevers, colds, hay fever, um, menstruation problems, uh, if you have dysentery, diarrhea, uh, if you chew on the fresh leaves, uh, that will help with a toothache. And again, I was thankful for that this year. Um, there you go. And it comes in many different colors. So this is my yarrow bed, I'm blending in a little bit with the Roman camel. But that is my herb garden. And so these are, these are just really important to me, all these herbs. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you guys sticking with me. I know that this has been a long tour uh, and we're only halfway through. So this is my, my medicinal herb garden. Uh, tomorrow I will take you through the food forest. And in the food forest, I have many, many medicinal herbs. Um, and then I will take you to all my gardens outside of these, these centralized gardens right here for my other herbs that need maybe a little bit different growing environment. I did want to say, um, with these herbs, a lot of them take a while to be established. Um, 
what they say about herbs is they first they sleep and then they creep and then they leap and so it's usually the third year before they really take on and, and do what they're supposed to do unless they're like a biannual or an annual uh, but most herbs are going to be perennial so my idea with this was get the things in as soon as possible and then figure out what they're for and how I can use them later on and so what I did was I got as many seeds like I went on to herb websites um, I got seeds I got some plants and I and I planted them uh, as soon as I possibly could because uh, I knew that as I was waiting for them to grow I could research and study how to use them and so that's what I did and um, you can't necessarily do that with vegetables because they're annuals and you grow them as you're growing them you need to know what to do with them and how to grow them herbs it's really just kind of like plant the seeds and then let them do their thing um, but I did know some of the needs that they wanted and so we are on a hill here and it, it definitely goes down and then in this little area right here there's usually like a, a drainage pond like if it rains for a long time it's going to be very wet and soggy and puddly there for a while and so you notice my marshmallow root is on the very bottom corner over there close to it because marshmallow right it likes to grow in marshy areas uh, everything along that bottom edge is going to enjoy uh, a wetter soil everything up here is going to enjoy a drier soil uh, i did make a mistake with my licorice on that and it took me a few years to figure out exactly what was going on but um but now i know to just keep that section of the, of the bed watered really well um but like uh everything up in this area is going to be a lot drier and things that are in these beds here are going to be needing a little bit more of a of a more nutrient dense soil so uh, things like echinacea, the licorice, um, the skullcap, uh, things like the elecampane, the self-heal. Well, not necessarily self-heal, but um, a lot of these that are in this area are going to need a, a, a better soil. And these were the beds that I put uh, cow manure and horse manure in in order to make these no-dig beds. Everything up here was just the soil that was here, which was off of a sandstone mountain on top of the mountain when all of the topsoil got washed down. And so just pretty much sand. Uh, and so those were things that I considered as I planted things. Um, and then if there was something that's a little bit more touchy with the zone, uh, I would put that if I could up here more because there's a sink there where the, where the water gathers and not only will water gather there, but frost will gather there as well. It'll be colder in that area. Heat rises, right? So I, you can tell I put the African dream root right next to the fever few down here. Um, and the, the hill, it goes, how does it, it goes down this way and it goes down this way into it, it collects over here. So it kind of comes up a little bit here. So the, the African dream root is not my zone. So I make sure I cover it with mulch a lot, um, but I, I put it not in this sink zone, but it also likes to have uh, damp soil as much as possible as well. So I had to, there's like a, a balancing act that I had to use right there. Um, anyway, if you guys have any other questions about why I grew things, the places that I did, please let me know because there is a reason and a method to the madness on why I planted everything where I did. Um, thank you for joining me today. I know it's been a long one. I hope you guys have an absolutely wonderful day. If you could hit the like button, that helps me out a lot. Uh, the notification, the subscribe, like <laughs> that really encourages me a lot and it helps out the channel a lot if you would. Um, I like to put something out almost every day. I have been stressed out of my mind doing crazy amount of stuff lately because I had that big trip and that just kind of threw a kink in things. And then we had company, we had um, birthdays and we had so I just needed to have some days where I was with my kids again and uh, after my long trip. And so things have gotten a little bit uh, backtracked a little bit, but I like to post almost every day. Um, and when you, 
when you subscribe and, and do that notification bell and the, the like button like that just really helps out a lot. So I appreciate all your support for those of you who have done that. And I encourage you to do it if you haven't. And please stick around for parts three and parts four of this medicinal herb garden tour. And if you didn't see the first part, go ahead and check out that video, part one of four. Uh, there's some really good stuff in there. I go over over 30 different herbs that I'm growing in that area. And then whatever we have in this one that you got to see here. So this is about half of my herbs. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you guys have an absolutely wonderful evening and stay blessed.